Court at Taylor Presbyterian Church. Our session has a scheduled meeting for uh, Sunday, June 7th, and at that meeting, hopefully, we will be able to set a reopening day for in-person uh, worship service here at Taylor, and we'll also be developing a list of procedures and restrictions that will be in place uh, when we do reopen. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Vicki Jenkins. Welcome, Vicki. Thank you, Hank. Let us call ourselves to worship. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Let us call ourselves into confession. We are the people of God, but scripture reminds us that we still sin. We need to confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus intercedes for us with the Father, who freely forgives us, through his infinite goodness and mercy. So let us draw near to God with sincerity and confidence and pray together. God, God we, we hear that you are a mighty God. God. We, we sing about your greatness. We read that you command the wind and waves. We talk as if you are in control. But if we're really honest, our prayers reveal that we often don't expect much from you. Forgive us for our lack of faith. Forgive us for believing that your greatness is more of an interesting idea than a deep reality. Give us a faith that matches what we sing. Make us bold, Heavenly Father. We ask not just for ourselves, but for the sake of the world. Amen. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope and glory of the Lord. We will firm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Please follow along with us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, who taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere, hear us as we pray for others in the name of Jesus Christ. Especially in this time of uncertainty and despair, hold us and protect us. Help us to navigate the future with caution and carefulness. Inspire the whole church with your power, unity, and peace. Plant seeds of love within our hearts and grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. Lead all nations in the way of justice and goodwill. Direct those who govern that they may rule fairly, maintain order, uphold those in need, and defend oppressed people, and that this world may claim your rule and know true peace. Awaken all people to the danger we have inflicted upon the earth. Implant in each of us a reverence for all you have made 
that we may preserve the delicate balance of creation for all coming generations. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy, that by their teaching and example they re reveal your love for all people. We give you all praise and thanks for the many blessings you bestow upon our life each and every day. Comfort and relieve, O oh Lord, all those who are in trouble, who sorrow, who find themselves in poverty, those who are sick, those who grieve, and especially those who are known to us this day. And now let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father, who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing heart. Our New Testament lesson is taken from Colossians. I'll be reading from chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Paul has been arrested and placed in prison for preaching, teaching, and praying the word of the Lord. Let us hear Paul's words to the Colossians. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us as well that God will open a door for the word, that we may declare the mystery of Christ for which I am in prison so that I may reveal it clearly, as I should. Conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, 
so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. this week's sermon, Powerful Prayer. March 13th, 2020 should have been a happy day for me. It was my birthday, my 65th birthday to be exact, my time for Medicare and more senior discounts. But on March 13th, President Trump declared the coronavirus a pandemic. The coronavirus now dominates the news. Extreme actions are being taken by governments to contain the spread of the disease. It has caused millions to lose their jobs. It's driven down the stock market. It's killed over 322,000 people worldwide with approximately 91,000 from the U.S. Our way of life looks different right now. It is affecting commerce, travel, entertainment, and sports, and the way we church. Sadly, you know that it's serious when Americans will close sports events and you can't find any toilet paper to buy. I'm sure you, like I, never thought we would have to worry about a pandemic in our lifetime. Those stories of the influenza pandemic of 1918 that affected one-third of the world's population were stories we couldn't imagine, and not with the medical advances we've seen in the last hundred years. Thinking of how we are dealing with the pandemic got me to thinking a lot about faith and prayer. Every prayer I pray now also asks God for healing, for protection, for assurance that we will get through this terrible pandemic. And because God is our sovereign Lord, of course we will. As we go forward from this point on, some things will change, but one of the things that won't change is God's love for us. My guess is many people who have never prayed are now praying. F.B. Meyer, the author of the great little book, The Secret Guidance, said, the tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. Instead of it being something we do every day, like breathing, eating, and walking, and talking, prayer seems to be, have become like that little glass covered box on the wall that says, break in case of emergency. It is true that so very often we associate prayer with crisis in our life. I heard a story the other day of a man who encountered a bit of trouble while flying his small airplane. He called the control tower and said, Pilot to tower, I'm 300 miles from the airport, 600 feet above ground, and I'm out of fuel. I am descending rapidly. Please advise, over. Tower to pilot, the dispatcher began. Repeat after me. Our Father, who art in heaven. Prayer is, for the most part, an untapped resource, an unexplored continent where untold treasure remains to be unearthed. It is talked about more than anything else and practiced less than anything else. And yet, for the believer, it remains one of the greatest gifts our Lord has given us outside of salvation. Paul was somebody who understood prayer and its power. Prayer was a part of Paul's life, and he took it for granted that it would be a part of every Christian's life. You cannot really be a good Christian and not pray, just as you cannot have a good marriage if you do not talk to your spouse. You can be a Christian and not pray, just like you can be married and not talk to your spouse. But in both circumstances, you will be miserable. Prayer is the pipeline of communication between God and his people, between God and those who love him. Charles Hodge declared that prayer is the converse of the soul with God. Let me offer four prayer considerations. Number one, pray with persistence. Paul begins in chapter four of Colossians by saying, continue steadfastly in prayer. The words translated continue steadfastly mean 
persist in, adhere firmly to, or remain devoted to, or give unremitting care to. It carries the idea of dedication. Of the ten times it is used in the New Testament, four of them have to do with being devoted to prayer. It is a very powerful word, and it is given as a command. In other words, persistence in prayer is not an option for the Christian. It is an order from the Lord himself. Two of the most instructive parables Jesus ever told on prayer are the ones in Luke 18 and Luke 11. Both have to uh, deal with being persistent and not giving up in prayer. Luke 18, 1 says, Now he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Luke 11, 19 is where we find a promise that says, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. George Mueller, known as one of the greatest prayer warriors of all times, had this to say about persistence in prayer. It is a common temptation of Satan to make us give up the reading of the word and prayer when our enjoyment is gone, as if it were no use to read the scriptures when we do not enjoy them, as if it were no use to pray when we have no spirit of prayer. The truth is that in order to enjoy the word, we ought to continue to read it, and the way to obtain a spirit of prayer is to continue praying. The less we read the word of God, the less we desire to read it, and the less we pray, the less we desire to pray. Be persistent in prayer. Number two, pray with passion. If you are persistent in something, it stands to reason that you are also passionate about it. In fact, Paul says that we should be diligent or watchful. This describes passionate prayer. Jesus was passionate about his prayer life. It was something he was always doing. S. D. Gordon, in his book, Quiet Talks on Prayer says, How much prayer meant to Jesus? It was not only his regular habit, but his resort in every emergency, however slight or serious. When perplexed, he prayed. When hard-pressed by work, he prayed. When hungry for fellowship, he found it in prayer. He chose his associates and received his messages upon his knees. If tempted, he prayed. If criticized, he prayed. If fatigued in body or worried in spirit, he had recourse to do one unfailing habit of prayer. Prayer brought him unmeasured power at the beginning and kept the flow unbroken and undiminished. There was no emergency, no difficulty, no necessity, and no temptation that would not yield to prayer. And every time we see Jesus praying, he was praying with passion. We read his prayers throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Prayers at his baptism, with his disciples, at his transfiguration, in the Garden of Yosemite, and while on the cross. Jesus always prayed with passion because he knew who it was he was talking to, and he knew the power of prayer to the Father. Prayer from the heart, that's what passionate prayer is. James 5, 16 reminds us the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Number three, pray with thankfulness. Paul never fails to mention it. Ephesians 5, 20 tells us that thanksgiving is the natural result of being filled with and walking under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4, 6 tells us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything we should pray, giving thanks as we make our petitions known to God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 tells us that giving thanks at all times is God's will for us in Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 16 says that as believers, everything we say or do should be done in the name of the Lord as we give thanks to him. Number four, pray, making intercession. Intercessory prayer is basically praying for others. 
It is praying for God's will to be done in the lives of other people. Intercessory prayers characterized the prayer life of Jesus. In Isaiah 53, 12, the Bible says, He himself bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. Luke 22, 23, Jesus tells Peter, I pray for you that your faith may not fail. Luke 23, 34, on the cross, Jesus was praying for others when he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. John 14, 15, Jesus interceded for us, asking the Father to send the Holy Spirit. There are many other examples. If you read your Bible, you'll find them. Jesus prayed intercessory prayers. He was always praying for others. Understanding the power of prayer, Paul wanted to be sure the Colossian Christians understood what it was they were to pray for. He wanted them to pray with a specific purpose. He wanted them to pray for him, asking God to open the door so that they could not, could speak the gospel. It was the gospel that Paul lived for. It was the preaching of the gospel that had landed Paul in prison. It was the preaching of the gospel that was ever on the forefront of Paul's mind. You see, Paul wanted God's kingdom to expand. Like Jesus, he was concerned about others, about their souls, their salvation, and their sanctification. Paul wanted their prayers to be in accordance with God's will. Paul was always concerned with doing the will of God. How many of our prayers are directed at the expansion of his eternal kingdom rather than the expansion of our petty kingdoms? If you were able to chronicle your prayers, knowing how much time you spent praying for different things, how much of your time would be spent praying for your family, for their health, for the health and well-being of your loved ones, compared to how much time you were praying for those who don't know the promise of salvation. Intercessory prayer changes things. When you pray for others, when you pray for God's work to be done, for his will to be accomplished, he will begin to use you and grow you in ways that will astonish those around you. You know well the familiar verse in Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think we do not become what God wants us to become because we are too focused on ourselves and not on others. It is when we pray for others that we will become more like Jesus. And as we become more like Jesus, God will grow us, he will show us, and he will use us more. Prayer opens our eyes, enabling us to see what God is doing, to see things we are blinded to without prayer. That's because prayer is communication. We speak to God, God answers to us, speaking to us, showing us. What does your prayer life look like this morning? Are you persistent in prayer? Are your prayers passionate? Are they filled with intensity and fervor, or are they weak, timid, and lacking faith? What about gratitude? How much time have you spent thanking God for all he has done for you? And who are you praying for? Is there anyone in your life that you pray you will get saved? If there is a burden on your heart to see God's kingdom expand, to see his will done, God calls us to worship him in hum humility. And as R.C. Sproul says, when we approach God in prayer and worship, and we are truly aware of his presence, we will surely be overwhelmed by his greatness. Let us pray. Merciful Father, giver of life, open our hearts so that we learn to pray with passion, gratitude, and love. Open our eyes and let us see the needs of others. Open our hands to reach out and do your will. And open our ears so that we may hear and obey. 
we give you all honor, praise, and glory for providing for us, for loving us, for saving us. Let us always pray, thy will be done. Amen. We give thanks then for the promise of our faith that the Lord God will bless and keep us, the risen Christ is with us, and the Holy Spirit connects us with believers near and far. We take comfort and inspiration from the example of the earliest believers who spent much time together in the temple and broke bread at home with glad and generous hearts. As we anxiously track the news in these times, with numbers of new cases, number of persons who have died, and numbers of those who are recovering, we remember the good news of the gospel. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. May the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy in believing, so that you may abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace and serve the Lord.